Welcome, Dennis Haralakis, to Coaching Session. How are you doing today? I'm very well, Michael. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for coming on. And I have you on today. We're going to be talking about money coaching, what you do, and how you help people. So in your own words, can you please tell the world what you do and how you can help them? Yes. So my name is Dennis Haralakis. I'm a certified money coach. Uh, and I also set up um, a company called Cambridge Money Coaching. Uh, money coaching looks at the patterns, the beliefs, the behaviors that we have around money, right? and it helps people to understand them. So understand the origins, build awareness. And once you have awareness, once you have an understanding of, of why you do what you do, it helps you to make better decisions. It reduces anxiety and other negative emotions, and it helps you communicate in healthy ways. So that's primarily the aim, the aim of, of money coaching is to bring awareness to people around this thing called money, which is in their lives. Um, but most of us have never really been shown how to use it or manage it. Is there a reason why many people haven't experienced that where they say, well, my mom taught me how to deal with money or my dad taught me how to deal with money. I know the school systems, I'm a former educator, and there's very few schools or districts that allow finance or accounting classes, or just general talking about money as the curriculum for their students. So many people are just kind of going through life without knowing about money. Can we, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Actually, um, there's a number of reasons uh, why um, understanding money is, is hard. And the fact that we're not taught about it, at least not really, uh, is, is, is one of them. The main reason um, that people find uh, managing money ha- that are so hard, their finances, is, is, is actually the, our brains that run basically everything. They're not wired for it. Right? Brains didn't evolve to, to handle money, and not just because money is only like 5,000 years old. They just, they just generally didn't. Uh, brains are wired for short-term gratification and immediate response to danger. So in simplistic terms, what that means is if there's something I want, well, then the best time to have it is obviously now, right? Short-term gratification. As well as wanting good things now, wherever possible, we also try and push discomfort into the future. So if you look at, you know, what's the best time to start that training program, um, get on that diet, sort up my finances. Well, you know, logically, when you and I are talking now, logically, it's now. But emotionally, it's in the future. Over the last 70 years or so, I'm not that old, but over the last 70 years or so, particularly recently, Finance has become pretty complex, right? Mm. We have credit, which is started in like the 1960s, but it's basically everywhere now. Mm. The almost physic disappearance of physical cash, particularly in the last couple of years when no one was allowed to use cash and no one went out very much. In the UK, I'm sure it's the same in the US. Uh, we get a lot of direct debits and standing orders. We hardly get bills anymore. We just get emails. Um, then we have debit cards and we have credit cards. Uh, you've got complex uh, tax system, you've got 401ks, um, and you've got stored value cards, and you've got um, store cards, and you've got Klarna, and you've got Layby, and you know all this stuff is really, really complex. It's become very, very complex. If I look at um, driving a car, and I've been driving a car for, for 40 years, I don't think it's got very more complex. I think actually it's probably got easier. Mm. But, but finance, finance really hasn't. Uh, and, and then, of course, you've got student debt and, you know, all this stuff. And complexity makes us anxious. The two biggest stresses for, for humans and, and mammals in general are uncertainty and lack of control. And I think if you ask most people about finance, it's not just like whether they can grow, you know, show how to manage money growing up, but uncertainty mm-hmm. and lack of control are features <laughs> of most people's, uh, most people's finances. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we touched on most of the time, uh, no one shows us how. Right. All my clients, the first question I ask is anyone you know, show you how to manage money? And the answer is always no. And obviously you can say, well, that's because they're coming to you. You're a money coach. But it's true across everybody that I talk to. Now, unfortunately, we don't start with a blank slate. We actually have it's like a subconscious inheritance around money and around most things that influences us. Most of our beliefs about who we are, how families behave, how the world works, how money works, all that stuff comes from the environment in which we we grew up. And very often that includes self-limiting beliefs that we have about ourselves or about ourselves and money. 
And messages that we grow up with in childhood, they can be very conscious. We can have things like, you know, money doesn't grow on trees or we don't talk about money or you can't take it with you. But more often than that, they're subconscious. So they're picked up from the environment and the behavior of the people around us. So if you grew up in an environment where there was anxiety around bills, uh, money arguments, all of that stuff soaks into our, into our subconscious. And even the stuff we don't see. So growing up, we see the adults around us spending money. Do we see them saving money? Do we see them investing it? It's just not visible to us. And so this stuff has to be taught and it's not always taught. Then if you do look into the kind of financial literacy space, um, a lot of people go, well, money's got numbers, right? We can turn money discussions into numeric discussions. So financial education that, that does exist is typically this austerity gospel about separate wants and needs. And, you know, it's all about money in and it's maths. And it's, you know, what, what is it that you don't get? You know, why is budgeting so hard? But actually the core of our, of our relationship with money is emotional because how I feel affects how I spend and that affects how I feel. And so emotions really are a, a really important part of, of this. But our culture, it teaches us, particularly for men, for guys, that expressing emotions is unsafe. So money's linked to emotions, but talking about emotions is unsafe. The word emotional, even the word emotional has very many negative connotations to it. And so we understand the messages from physical pain. You know, my foot hurts, my head hurts. Maybe I need to take, a, a, you know, Tylenol or maybe I need to drink some water or get out the sun or whatever else it is. Right? We understand that feedback mechanism, but we resist the messages from emotional pain. We're told to man up or, you know, don't worry about it, it'll pass. And emotions are really important signals from the body, from the brain, and they're really important in making decisions. You can't ignore emotions. People without emotions are generally known as psychopaths. So emotions mm -hmm. are really important, but we're taught not to, to ignore the messages from emotions. And our education process teaches us that if we don't understand something, um, we don't know why, there must be something wrong with us. I'm doing something wrong. I don't know what it is. It must be me. And we've heard this growing up, right? Why did you do that? What's wrong with you? Why don't you understand this? What's wrong with you? How could you say that? What's wrong with you? So we, we internalize a lot of this stuff around what we don't, you know, something that we don't know, and, but we can't. So with money, right, we use it every day. You know, that doesn't mean we know how to use it. Mm -hmm. And so we're like, I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, we, we, we use this all the time. And, be, you know, and because we're adults, right, we're expected to know how to do it. We have expectations around ourselves. So yeah, money is a core survival need. It's really important because it buys food, shelter, sex, social acceptance, all those things that are really important to us at a, at a survival level, things that trigger us. Um, and that means that it's very tied in to our, our reactive systems, the fight and flight, those irrational parts of the brain. Just to, to wrap it up, right? We have this thing that's central to our lives that no one shows us how to manage that we misunderstand, but we don't talk about because there's this culture of silence. We're surrounded by people talking about money, but not about how we feel about it, how it makes us feel. That bit we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. And so this thing's wired to our emotions, our self-worth, and we make mistakes with it. And when we end up with mistakes, we end up with anxiety, guilt, shame, regret. And this blocks us. So if you not managing your finances, if you've got debt, no savings, unable to spend money, all this stuff is normal. And it's totally understandable based on your experiences growing up and how you feel about yourself and money and money and yourself. So I think that gives you hopefully a you know, slightly bigger picture as to how this thing, you know, that's in our lives that we just don't really understand. But when you start to pick it apart for people, they can begin to understand and see, oh, right, that's the awareness building process. You said something early on where our brains are not structured for money, where we didn't develop for saying, well, we need to put something in our brain that's going to deal with money, right? Of course, we have basic survival, you know, the fight or flight type of thing, how to, you know, procure food. So we have the ability to stay alive. Over the years, we developed a barter system and that barter system evolved into what money is. 
where I'm going to exchange my money that I worked for, for an item or a service. So now what people have done is that they've taken the action out of surviving, right? They don't have to go hunt anymore. They can go to the grocery store and they can buy a steak or, or they can buy some rice. They can do that because they have the money. So life has become more simplified in the sense of we don't have to go be hunters and gatherers anymore. So we have this value system. And just as you said it, we weren't developed to have a money system. We were developed to go out, be hunters, survivors, not so much of being in a plush home with the heat and the AC. And now guess what? We just pay everything with money. So now we're so stressed about keeping this easy lifestyle because the brain understands something on the subconscious level that if I don't keep up with my money, I don't get this easy lifestyle. I'm going to be out in the environment, the hot sun, the cold winters. I'm going to have to hunt for my food. And that is more work than just going to the grocery store and picking up your items. So now our brain is kind of like tricking us in a sense of it understood how difficult it was in the beginning and is understanding how easy it is now. So it's saying, well, I don't want to lose this. So then we have this attachment with money or with valuable items, right? It's called, you know, materialistic type of mentality. So they have this unhealthy attachment. And what I find is that when many people, they get some money, they hold on to it really, really tight. And it's not so much that they're unwilling to give it away is that they're afraid that they won't have enough. They have that scarcity type of mindset where, yes, that money will do better if you invest it than sitting in a bank account or sitting underneath your mattress. But some people feel like they have to have this safety net per se. And I'm not against having a safety net three to six months of living expenses saved up for in a case of emergency. I'm all for that. The problem is when you get there, what do you do with the remainder? Do you just keep tacking on and say, well, for a rainy day? And, mm. and, then, and then now they're suffering because now they're working for money rather than have their money work for them. Again, we have this unhealthy relationship with money because we're thinking in the wrong mindset of my money can help me grow. And then we get into this idea and some people know it. They think about passive income. Oh, I can purchase a bunch of homes with money and those homes generate income for me. So now the money is kind of working as an investment, but that is another conversation that we don't really necessarily have is something that people have to go out and learn for themselves. Sure. So the conversation starts when we're young. It might be something that we talk about like at Walmart or at the local grocery store, or we say, you know what? Money is one of those taboo things that we never had enough. So we just ignore the case that we don't have it. And I know growing up for me, we didn't necessarily talk about money in the sense of, all right, well, we got to save this amount of money. We got to invest this amount of money. It was always like, okay, well, we get our check and we have to use that money that we get for all the things we need for that week or that month. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like we put ourselves in a rat race naturally from a young age because our parents don't take the time to say, hey, this is how money should be versus how I'm treating it. Because yeah, this whole problem with money and how we view it can't be stopped with just parents waking up and saying, hey, I'm going to teach my kid how to do money like this versus how I learned how to do money. And then just saying, well, that is how I was taught. So I'm just going to keep going with that negative type of learning where the kid is going to suffer, especially if they go off to college, get all the student loan debt, and they don't even realize what this money is because in their head, they don't see it physically. They just know this is how much money I need. This type of service will get me this type of money. Now, when they're all done with college, they have a massive amount of debt and they have all of this stress. So I wanted to touch base on that conversation of money when we start younger, from when we're kids, how we talk to our kids about, well, this is what money is, how we should do it. This is cash. And then talking maybe the value about it, because I know there's two schools of thought. Money doesn't grow on trees can be negative. 
money doesn't grow on trees can be a positive thing. So they understand that money is not something that they can just easily go get, you know, just out in nature and they just pick it, right? They have to earn it. They have to work for it. Many thoughts on that. Wow. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in there. And you really, you made a really interesting point that money doesn't grow on trees can mean different things to different people. Generally, the message is, no, you can't have it. That's what a lot of time parents are trying to say when you go, well, you know, mom, can I have a bike or can I have an ice cream or can I have this? And like mommy, uh, money doesn't grow on trees. Mm -hmm. And so how you interpret that is what, and amongst all the other messages that you're getting, creates your relationship with money. I'm just going to unpack that slightly. Your relationship with money is how do I feel about myself? How do I feel about money? And how do I feel about money in myself? Mm. There's three components to it. And how do I feel about myself is really important because your relationship with anything, and it could be food, it could be exercise, it could be work, it could be your family, it could be um, your partner, whoever it is, it could be your church, starts with how do I feel about myself? Then how do I feel about money? And how do I feel about money in myself coming after that? And that's based on the messages you got about money and the messages you got about money and yourself from that from that environment and that starts really young so most of what you believe around money unless you've taken active steps to change it will have been formed by the time you're seven and definitely by the time you're 10 or 12 because that's when you absorb everything how you feel the world works how you think the world works right because Growing up, if you think about l- the learning process, we as adults, we go learning, right? School, conscious cognitive process, information comes in, we memorize it, we learn how to regurgitate it, and we spit it back out, right? That's not how kids learn. That's not how infants learn because they don't have language. But an infant is wired to work out how to get its needs met, to stay alive, to feel safe. Mm-hmm. So the learning process for an infant is really, really powerful. It's subconscious, it's really powerful, and it's based on everything that's going on around it. And that's why it's so, it forms such strong uh, bonds for the rest of your life, because it's subconscious, it's powerful, it's automatic, and it's really important for survival to learn how to get your needs met, your physical needs met, and your emotional needs met. Because humans aren't born with, with any survival skills. They're pretty useless for a long period of time. <laughs> you can watch a horse being born and it starts to run after 30 seconds. So, so much of, of that behavior is hardwired into, in, into all the other mammals. But for infants, it's not. You basically start with some DNA and uh, a brain that starts to form connections. In fact, it's already doing it in the womb. So mm-hmm. now the reason I'm talking about this is because it's really important to acknowledge the strength and the power of that early learning experience. So when you're talking about what do parents do, people come in with financial literacy courses and you take 15 year olds, 16 year olds, you take kids that are about to go to college or wherever it is. And you go, Oh, you need to learn about a loan. You need to learn about this. You need to learn about that. It's like saying to them, Oh, you need to learn about healthy eating five fruits a day. You know, if you spent the last 16 years of your life growing up in a home, where most people are, are, you know, eating, well, however they're eating, right? I don't want to sound judgmental, maybe they're eating buckets, maybe they're not eating buckets. That is going to form your view. It doesn't matter what logical, you know, financial education is, is appealing to the logical part of the brain, but it's the emotional part of the brain that runs all of those relationships, the relationship with food, money, sex, or, or, you know, all, all of that stuff ourselves. So where I'm going with this is that, and I do run webinars and courses for teaching parents how to raise financially capable children which is kind of what you what you wanted to ask Mm -hmm. so they learn from what's going on around us they learn from what they see us doing if we shout and scream at each other about money if we freak out when the bill arrives if we try and hide debt or spending if we use money to control or manipulate other people that's what kids will learn so the Mm -hmm. first point the most important point is understand your own money as a parent, understand your own money behavior, build a healthy relationship with money, model good behavior around money. Part of the, pro- the, the two main problems with this space is most people aren't aware of their own behavior. They're kind of aware of it in a subconscious sense, but they'll go, ah, that's just who I am. And then you get, because everybody comes out of childhood with a unique relationship with money, 
you can have um, siblings, twins, triplets, they can all be different uh, around money. So the chances of you having a relationship with someone who, a partner who has the same think about money is pretty small. Mm-hmm. Because we don't talk about it. We don't sit down and go, right, how do you think about money? What's your relationship with money? Let's make sure we're compatible before, <laughs> before we get into a relationship, before we have kids, before we settle down. We don't talk about this stuff. Mm-hmm. And this stuff we kind of find out. And then we end up in this kind of dance with the other person where we're going like, I don't understand why you do that. And then the other person's going, well, you always do this, you know? And, and so anyway, couples coaching around money is a, is a, is a separate issue. But mm-hmm. when you think about it, right, I don't understand my behavior and I definitely don't understand yours and why you keep doing that. So this creates an environment in the, around money in the home environment that kids are growing up in. And it's difficult. They're looking for consistency in messaging and it's got to be positive consistency in messaging. So if you've got someone going, you know, I don't know why your dad always wastes money or your mom always money or, you know, or, you know, you can't spend any money. You're so tight. You're so mean. You're this. You don't care. And all that stuff. Right. Money is the biggest cause of divorce and suicide in the Western world. Mm-hmm. So all of this is leaking out into the money space around in the environment which we go around up in. So understand your own money story if you and, and model good behavior. Get aligned with your with your partner doesn't mean you have to agree but just get a line around what behavior you're going to model in front of your children because that's what they're going to copy you want your children to make um considered decisions around purchasing stuff but you're wandering into target and going what's the biggest tv you got give it to me now no judgment but what i'm saying is that's what your kids are going to do Mm. so you want them to do something different you want them to be charitable you want them to make long-term considered decisions, you've got to model that, right? Because that is the learning process that your kids are going through. It's not a logic-based learning process. It's a, how do I learn from what's going on around me based process? So that's, that's the first and most important thing. Because if you model good behaviors, then, okay, you know, that's what you, you, your kids will, kids will pick up on. You need to model good behaviors around uh, doing chores, right? You're part of a family. Um, there are there's stuff that needs to be done as a family. Make your bed or, you know, clearing up after the table, taking the trash out, walking the dog. And there's a whole bunch of stuff. Depends where you live and how you live. But essentially, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on around being a family. And that's kind of related to building a work ethic. A work ethic is about doing something well because of it and not because you're being paid for it, because in itself, it's an important task to do. It has an intrinsic value. And that means if you want your kids to do things well, you've got to do it yourself too, right? It means that if your wife says or your partner says to you, honey, can you clean the dishes up? You don't go, ah, forget it, make the kids do it. Or, you know, you have to model that behavior. So building mm-hmm. chores is important. And where um, a lot of people come unstuck in this is this concept of paying kids to do things that should be part of a family. Mm. Okay, okay, you know, if you make your bed, if you do this, if you do that, the other, I'll give you, I'll give you money for that. Now, I understand why people do that, and it's mean it's meant with the best intentions, but it creates problems because what do you do if the kid doesn't tidy up the floor or make the bed or you know, you take money away from them? Mm. So then you end up in a situation where you're using money as a tool of control. So what's that teaching kids? So there's a paradox around this building, uh, you know, doing chores, doing stuff that's important to do. And yet, what do you do with with kids? So you you have to take money out of it. Otherwise, money gets associated, as I said, with control. It gets associated with punishment. It gets associated with all, all negative activities. Now, you can say that there's certain things that I'll pay you for. So maybe you wash the car. I'll pay you to wash the car. That's fine. Right. If you don't want to do it yourself or you pay someone else to do it, that's okay. Right. But understand that if you want your kids to learn about delayed gratification, if you want your kids to learn about doing jobs well, because they're part of the family, part of responsibility, part of building a work ethic, then take money out of it. Money is uh, the uh, uh, like allowances, pocket money, stuff like that is a financial literacy tool. Right. And that's why you don't I think it's challenging when people pay kids to pass exams now just imagine you have two kids one who's really good and one who really isn't 
what happens there? Do you give them the same amount of money if they pass exams or not? Do you, you know, it's very easy to see how this thing spirals out of control. Mm -hmm. Do they go, oh, well, actually, you know, uh, Marvin's dad gives me, uh, gives him, you know, $10 for everything, you know, every grade. So you end up in this whole world of pain, I think, quite frankly, and confusing money with love, confusing money with, in, you know, doing things intrinsically. So just a couple of things to, to watch out for. Giving allowances is the best financial literacy tool there is because what you're, ask, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get kids to learn how to handle money. And they can't do it if you don't give them money to do it. Now, it's not free money, right? It's like me saying to you, hey, uh, Michael, I'm going to teach you how to ride a bike by giving you a lecture on uh, momentum. You have to give someone a bike and you have to let them go and you have to let go of the seat and you have to get them off to, to learn their own mistakes. So with, with financial literacy, teaching kids financial literacy is saying, okay, I'm going to give you some money and you're going to learn how to use money. Now, this is not extra money, right? We're going to say, okay, what do you spend on sweets, clothes, whatever it is? It's not exact science. It doesn't really matter. The processes of saying being fair and being open and going, okay, if you spend... $10 a week on sweets. I'm not going to buy you sweets anymore. Here's your $10. Now go out and learn how to handle that, how to learn how to manage it, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have to let them go because the kids, right? If you give kids a chocolate bar, some of them are going to eat the whole thing and some of them won't. But eventually they'll find out what works for them. Mm -hmm. Now, because it's money, we get paranoid. We go like, oh my God, he spent, she spent the $10 all in one go. She's going to be like ruined for life. You know, we've got to stop this experiment. This is terrible. We're teaching her all the wrong things. No, 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 no. What you, you have to let them try and you have to let them make mistakes because that's how we learn. Mm -hmm. If you don't, right, if you don't do that and you're going to take, uh, what's the average age that kids go to, to college uh, when, they, when they leave home and they go to college? 18. 18, right. So you're going to try and teach an 18-year-old how to manage a budget? That ain't going to work, right? But if you've started at seven or eight or nine or whenever it is, and they've learned how to save money or they've learned how to manage it, and they've learned, and then you move from weekly, you move to monthly, and they've learned how to take like $20 and make it last a month. Mm -hmm. Then they're ready to go to college when they give them a large sum of money or a large sum of debt, I should say. And then they've got to learn how to manage it. That is not the time with everything else that's going on and all the social pressure to go out and hang out for, for kids to learn how to do budgeting not at 18 that's not the right time to do it so you need to do it earlier you need to step back from judgment around spending decisions you need to let them go because if you keep telling them why are you wasting money and all that crap what's the message there the message is like uh, i don't trust you to make good decisions you're not making good decisions what's wrong with you we move back into that shame and guilt around my decision-making process, my spending. And then we move back into how do I feel about myself and how do I feel about myself and money? So just step back. If you want to control the spending decisions, let's say it's clothes or let's say it's makeup, whatever it is, don't give them the money for it. Let them have the ability to learn how to spend and make spending decisions when they're at an age, when mistakes can be corrected, when lessons can be learned. And there's no big sums of money involved. Mm -hmm. And part of this, part of this is showing them how to save. So if you're giving your kid $5 a week, for example, to make the maths easier, you give them $4 and you give them another dollar and you put into a savings pot. And you talk about why savings is important and what that savings pot is for. And maybe, um, you know, you give them a little bit of interest. So if they can get, if they can save a certain amount of money, then you give them a little, you know, maybe give them a dollar, right? Because they're not earning any interest in fee events. Mm -hmm. So you help them to understand and build the process of delayed gratification, to build the saving and to make it worthwhile for them to do that. Yeah, no, that is a lot to unpack there, but I'm going to unpack it. One of the ideas that I was given when I was younger was that you had to spend a lot of money. So my mom would go to the grocery store and she would get the $200 grocery bill, $300 grocery bill. So as soon as I became an adult, guess what my grocery bill was? $300 every single week. And I'm thinking, I'm only getting groceries for one person. Why is my grocery bill $300? And it was just subconsciously me looking at my mom, 
how she went shopping. And then I said, I have to mimic that. So Mm. I would go to the grocery store and spend $300. And I was already pretty good with money. And I knew how to do credit cards, accounting, balancing, everything. Like that wasn't the problem. The problem was I didn't have a good relationship with shopping because I just saw what she did, her routine, her habits, and I just made it my own. And it wasn't until I said, something is wrong with this, where I can be getting the groceries I need and not getting the things I don't need per se, because I'm also buying the junk food that she would buy. Oh yeah, I remember my mom, she bought chips. This is what I'm supposed to do, buy some chips. And then, oh yeah, she got some ice cream too, just in case. I got some ice cream too, just in case. And then I'm getting all these unhealthy things, number one, but then I'm wasting all this money because yeah, it's nice once in a while to get a, a treat whether it be ice cream, you know, some chips, something like that. I'm not saying not to live your life, right. but how do you do it? If you can imagine growing up, you're buying a lot of sugary cereals, a lot of like individual pack goods. So whether they be like power bars or they'd be like fruit snacks, there's many things that kids will gravitate toward if they're hungry or they want something to eat, they would get that fruit snack. And then as adults, we're thinking, well, we need those fruit snacks because that's what we had. Mm-hmm. Our body changes. So we have to know what our body needs rather than what we gave our body when we were younger. So then that idea of, okay, I'm in control of my budget. How do I do that? Right. And then I started to think, well, let's break this down even more. If I have kids, how would I want to teach them about money? Because I don't want them to go to the grocery store and see me spending $300 on things that we don't necessarily need for the home. Right. And you're probably chucking some stuff away as well because you can't eat three hundred dollars worth of groceries. Exactly. Well. Exactly. So so it's it's a lot of waste where it's like, okay, we're buying all this food, but we're not able to eat it. So things just get thrown away and then I'm not being efficient with the money. And so I was like, okay, there has to be a way we can look at this. So I started to think, well, what happened if we split the money into different areas where we can have spending money, we can have saving money, similar to how you said, put into a pot, and then we have investing money. And that's going to be for the early stages. And then it can kind of evolve a little bit later where we can talk about, well, let's add another pot. And that, and that could be our charity pot where we give. So, so it evolves as we grow up in in age. So of course, when they're young, let them make that mistake. You're hundred percent correct. Because if they don't realize that, okay, I had $10, I bought all my candy with $10. Now I don't know, you know, like, where am I going to get $10 from again? Right. Am I going to ask mom or dad, or do I have to wait until next week? So, so just depending on how the parent is going to regulate that type of money. So they said, maybe they say, I'm going to give you $9 a week. Right. And that's going to be for you to figure out how you put into your pots. So maybe you put $6 into spending, you put $2 into saving the $1 into investing, and then you can kind of Make something. Every time you reach $10, I give you $1 for savings. Every time you reach $10 for investing, I give you $2. So mm. they learn, okay, I'm getting more money when I invest rather than I just save. So it is a way for parents to realize like, okay, I'm teaching them about money, but I'm still allowing them to make mistakes because if they have no money in savings, they're not getting a dollar. If they're not investing, they're not getting two extra dollars. Yeah. And what they do with that two extra dollars can be to put in their pot for more investing to compound it because they're going to get to more $10 quicker if they if you think about it. And then if, or they can say, well, I'm just going to use my $10 and, and spend it. So it just depends on how they interpret that little bit. And then as they develop their cognitive levels of critical thinking, they're going to say, this is actually a better deal than me just going out and spending all my money. Did you want to say something on that? Yeah, and you're, you're absolutely right. And I just want to, to emphasize that um, th- there is no judgment in my approach on, mm-hmm. on this, right? what you're looking to build is a healthy relationship with money, which means essentially conscious, positive engagement with finances. A lot of people grew up being told we don't talk about money or money's rude or money's dirty or, you know, whatever else it is. So, you know, this, this has really bad consequences for people all their lives. So, you know, it's really about opening up the conversation to ways of thinking and the ways of 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 handling money the ways of understanding money the ways of building a conscious positive relationship with money and i'm glad you mentioned um the investment investing and the 
because the, and the charity piece because there are actually two more pieces as well to this you know one is open money conversations my kids come home how much money does does daddy earn how much mom does does mommy earn you know stuff like that a lot of people go Ooh, no no we don't talk about that sort of stuff um now what that means is to a child it's like oh right oh we don't talk about money okay fine that's you know clearly a problem and so the answer to that is don't shut down money conversations you talked about having very open money conversations and that's really hard for a lot of people my advice in this space is always start with a question oh that's really interesting why did you ask that question See, if, if, if kids come to you and they're asking questions, their minds are kind of open for learning. Mm. So if you've told a kid that we don't talk about money and then like the, the week before they go to college, you sit them down and go, right, now we need to have that money chat. You're wasting your time. You've missed your moment. Their minds are not on it right then. They're on it when they came to you and they might have asked a money question like, you know, any question, like whatever it is. But if you shut it down because you're like slightly triggered and freaked out by it, then you, then you shut them off from that. So when whatever they do, whatever question they ask, you come, they come to you and go, how much money do we have in the bank? Are we rich? Oh, you know, how much money do we earn? How much debt do we have? You never shut it down. You say, that's a really interesting question. What made you think that? What made you mm -hmm. ask that? And that's going to give you a little bit of time to think about it. And it's also going to give you some context because if the kids have been in the talking about it in, in, in the playground or whatever else it is. You go one way with a conversation. Maybe the kid has a friend whose dad just died or lost his job or whatever it is. And they're going, they're looking for reassurance from you because they've just had a friend go through a really scary and unpleasant experience. And if you go, oh, no, we don't talk about money. You've just lost them there, then and there. right? And so never shut down money conversations. Always look for a way to have greater context and understanding and then just go exploring with it and and what blocks us is because we didn't have those conversations growing up or maybe the kids have come home and you go hey you know we should be investing in crypto now the answer is still the same that's really interesting what made you think that mm -hmm. not like don't be an idiot or whatever you know whatever crypto is a ponzi scheme or crypto is ridiculous whatever it is it, you, you what you're doing is you're punishing a child for asking questions around money and that's really bad. So if you don't know something, and that's okay, right? <laughs> well, there's a whole bunch of stuff we don't know about, a whole bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. What you do is you go on a journey of exploration with your child. And you go, crypto, that's really interesting. Why did you ask that question? What have you heard about it? And then you go, well, I don't know very much about this. Let's go and explore this together. Mm -hmm. So you're modeling a few things there. One is how to respond, how to talk about money, how to learn with your child all sorts of positive behaviors that you want your child. You don't want your child to be afraid to ask questions. You don't want your child to be afraid of the learning process. You want your child to embrace lifelong learning and you can model that as a parent. Mm -hmm. And so this thing with money is like, we have all this stuff from our childhood and, 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 and our own fears and, and, and guilt and shame that we carry around it. And when, when people raise that, when our kids raise that, that's the first thing that comes out. So you've got to push that to the back and go, that's really interesting. Let's talk about that. Mm. And, and you've taken it a, a step further, which is really beautiful. And you've talked about, you know, pots for investing, pots for growing, rewards for all of that. I think one of the best ways to, to do this is to, if you're going to do that, you can, you can um, put some money away for kids in, in a tax-free investment. I don't know what the equivalent is in the, in the US, but you can put $10 a month or something into into a really, really low cost ETF. You can use Vanguard ETFs or mm -hmm. whatever, you've, whatever you've got. And they're really, really cheap. And, and the platforms are really, really cheap. You can just, for kids, and you can, you can show them how that money grows over time. And then when they're 18, yeah, they get to take it. Mm -hmm. But what you've given them is two things. It's a really powerful message in compounding and long-term investing over 18 years. I put $10 up, $120 a month into this um i haven't done the calculation recently but if if we assume kind of normal growth projections that's going to give you something like four thousand dollars when the kids are when the kids 18 so you can start that when they're one or zero and you give them a really powerful lesson in regular saving regular investing compounding now parents come to me go oh well yeah what happens if they spend all the money when they're 18 i go well actually that's kind of up to you isn't it what have you modeled at that point in time around behavior to them 
Mm-hmm. That's not a reason not to give them uh, a ten dollar a month investment if you can afford it, right? And, and I, I want to be, you know, very sensitive to a lot of people can't afford this stuff, right? And a lot of people are struggling. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm I'm well aware of that. But if you can, this is another great way of showing kids how to do that, so that when they're eighteen, they can go, oh wow, that's been really interesting. If I leave that, it'll double every ten years. Or if I put more into it, or you know, what's really important about that is to show that what saving and investing does, whereas what running credit card debt and payday loans doesn't do for you. Hmm. So you could begin to go, okay, well, <laughs> you're spending $100 a month on servicing this credit card. If you put $100 a month into the US stock market and you threw, then you would have, uh, well, the calculations I've done is something like $300,000 after 40 years. So I'm throwing big numbers out there, but what I'm trying to share is that building awareness of what is you know potentially open to people and having a positive conscious engagement with your finances is really really important you know that and and i guess we're both talking about ways ways to to ensure that we do it and the same thing is around charity i just would say that charity i think is a very personal thing but telling kids to be charitable doesn't make them charitable you have to do it yourself you can't Definitely. tell a kid to be like kind and caring and sharing without 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 doing it yourself and you know this whole conversation about money talk is one of those conversations that many people are going to listen to and they're going to say i wish i had this conversation when i was younger everybody Mm -hmm. and everybody and that's going to be powerful because now if you're a parent even if you're an uncle or aunt you can still have that conversation with someone who's younger in your family you can yeah Mm -hmm. absolutely use this if you have a child and you're like going oh god this is freaking me out i wish my mom had told me i wish my parents had told me this but now i've got all this anxiety and guilt Use this as your lever to go on a journey with your child on this process of going, okay, fine. This is really important for them to learn how to do well. I didn't do so well myself, and that's okay, right? The reason I started with uh, that whole thing about why is managing money so hard is because you need to start this process with, with self-compassion and self-forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Right? You, we beat ourselves up because we don't do something well that no one showed us how. It's not your fault. Most of those decisions you did not make. No one chooses to be guilty or ashamed or anxious. No one chooses any of this stuff. It just comes up because we weren't shown how to do something. And so don't let that block the next generation. Don't let your anxieties and guilt and shame, regret become their anxieties and guilt and shame and regret. Learn how to move forward. And if you don't know anything about the financial system, there's so much stuff out there. Go and go on a journey with your child learn about this stuff. And for parents who would like to, I guess, be more efficient with how they make their child see money, you're going to want to get someone like Dennis to kind of guide you along that path too. So you can repair what you've learned and understood about money. That's what a money coach is necessarily doing. Let's understand how money works, how your money works, how you think about money. It goes so much deeper than, well, let's make a budget. Let's not do this. Let's not do that. Learning the relationship of money is going to not help you, but it's going to help your children too. So yeah. that's why I have Dennis on to not just talk about kids, but to talk about how are you using money? Because you have to at some time understand if I have something incorrect in my learning, let me invest. Let me try to not remain ignorant any longer. And let me yeah. do something that's going to be proactive so I don't keep on with the same negative habits in my whole family. We, we can end that. It's just that we have to be aware of, okay, I'm using money the wrong way. I'm thinking about money the wrong way. And it's not that you're a bad person. It's not that. It's just Ooh. that we never learned it. And going right. back to our initial thing we said, it's not a human instinct. We naturally no. don't know about money. So we're no. learning it as we go. And as we go, we realize, okay, we made a lot of mistakes, but we learn and we grow from there. So then we just have to do our best to get better and make sure our offspring is better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't have put it better myself. mm -hmm. So Dennis, if you can, please give us a few last words and then please share with people how they can find you. The few last words are don't blame yourself. Look at some of the things that you think and feel and believe around money and ask yourself, are they helping me? 
are they making the future easier? Are they taking me towards the person I want to be or, or, or away from the person I want to be? And step back and go, okay, well, if they're not helping me, that awareness piece is the, is the key to change. And if you need help, reach out. There is quite a lot of stuff around in this. So the first thing is don't blame yourself and then look for ways, small ways to build better habits, to have better engagement and to model that behavior for your children. So if you want to find me, I'm in England. I'm at cambridgemoneycoaching.uk. That's all one word, cambridgemoneycoaching.uk. There's stuff on my website, my blog, my resources around this. There are some great books on understanding um, money behavior. There's some great books on helping your kids understand money behavior. And so uh, good luck, everybody. Uh, It's your chance to change the future for the next generation. And I'm here to help if, if anyone wants to reach out to me. And I want to thank you so much for coming on, Dennis, and sharing your wisdom, your knowledge, your expertise in the whole realm of money coaching. And I know many people who are going to reach out to you, they're going to have that question in the back of their mind, is this going to help? And the answer is yes, right? Getting more financially literate in your own personal life is going to help you become less stressed, less anxious, and more positive in the sense of my future is not as bleak as I'm making it seem to be. Because money can be heavy. Stress can of credit card debt can be heavy. Yeah. You have to learn how to manage that. And Dennis is going to be your guide to help you manage that, to help you on a path where you can get into a better mindset of how we think about money and how you treat and utilize money. So again, thank you so much, Dennis Har Halakis, for coming on Coaching the Session. It was a pleasure. Michael, it's a pleasure too. Thank you so much.